Welcome back to the Cardio Seeds podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Svetlana Shemon, CEO of Cardio Seeds. Before we get started for our journey today, I have a brief announcement for you. A quick message. My new book titled Resilience in Scrubs, Thriving as a Woman Resident Physician is available now on Amazon in Kindle and paperback. I crafted this book specifically as a self-help manual for women physicians at the onset of their medical careers. It's packed with helpful materials ranging from navigating gender dynamics, mastering salary negotiations, stepping into leadership roles, finding the right mentors, balancing personal and professional wellness. The book also delves into burnout, prevention, family planning. It offers a guide to financial planning and even includes healthy recipes. So it's available now on Amazon and it serves as an invaluable gift for aspiring female physicians. So please take a moment to explore it. The title is Resilience in Scrubs, Thriving as a Woman Resident Physician. And with that, Let's get started. This year, as you may know already, Cardio Seeds podcast has several episodes featuring members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And today we have a wonderful guest with us. Dr. Anama Udea Thomas is a versatile healthcare professional with a very cool background and a very extensive experience. Dr. Thomas holds triple board certification. She is board certified in nursing, primary care, and lifestyle medicine. She specializes in integrating various health disciplines, focusing in on vulnerable populations, and she currently serves as an adult health nurse practitioner in Borinquen Medical Center in Miami, Florida, while also running a private health and wellness coaching service, You Solely Care. Dr. Thomas is also an author with her book, Car Talk, Body Talk, reflecting her integrative approach to primary care. She published the book under the pen name Dr. Sunday. It's available on Amazon in both paperback and ebook. There is so much more to her inspirational work that I can't wait to ask her all about it. So with no further delays, Dr. Thomas Udea, welcome to the Cardio Seeds podcast. It's my honor and pleasure to have you on today. Thank you so much, Lana. It's great to be here with you. I've been looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. So, Dea, um, this year, as I told you before, and I, um, our listeners and viewers know also, for the um, Lifestyle Medicine 2024 series um, on the Cardio Seas podcast, um, it features members of the American um, College of Lifestyle Medicine, including yourself. And um, I've been asking all of them, uh, all of my me ACLM member guests, um, the same five questions, essentially. And so with that, we will start with your first question, if you're ready. Um, uh, Dr. Thomas, uh, what is your chosen niche within the lifestyle medicine, within wellness um, sector, if you I may say so, uh, within lifestyle medicine domain. And in the next several minutes, can you tell us what makes you, your cause, your business approach unique? Okay, I will do my best to do that. Uh, so I consider my niche, um, focused on behavioral health. And I use the seven principal energy centers from yoga as a framework for working towards optimal health. So I believe this works really nicely with lifestyle medicine because we're looking at all of the different aspects of the body, mind, and the spirit and bringing those together in union. So Specifically, I focus on anxiety with women 
and stress reduction methods and increasing the parasympathetic activity and reducing symptoms of anxiety. So we know that anxiety is a disorder that has surpassed depression in the global burden of disease, and it's still largely underreported. And uh, interestingly, my research for my PhD was focused on this area as well, anxiety, uh, group visits, and the incorporation of mindfulness in the group visits. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting that that this topic is so huge right now, um, even uh, especially post-COVID. And the reason um, for this is that anxiety results in symptoms that are global and affect the whole body. So I'm sure you know, as a cardiologist, <laughs> you've seen many uh, uh, patients with anxiety referred to you to rule out organic heart conditions, mimicking as anxiety. Um, so by the time an anxiety dose diagnosis is reached, the research shows that um, they've been to the doctor on average like 10 times before, you know, actually, you know, putting all the pieces together. Um, so, you know, with all due respect, like, what do we do next? We give them pills as the fastest way to address the symptoms. However, the root cause are still lurking under the surface. So I feel my niche is really to bring like my experience as a yogi from the age of 19 um, and then getting certified as a teacher um, 12 years ago to really bring that into lifestyle medicine. And it's already there. So it's not like it has to be brought in, but my specific niche is to really look at each principal energy center. And I know you know, um, lifestyle medicine has the six pillars and yoga has the seven principal energy centers, which follow the colors of the rainbow. And so I, you know, I utilize that, you know, that framework to kind of operate with the patients that I see and also look at where their imbalances are in which energy center and what lifestyle medicine interventions could be utilized um, to balance those energy centers, if that makes sense. And then in, you know, with anxiety and specifically with women, and I tend to uh, work mostly with um, minority or immigrant women um, living in South Florida, very international community. It is very important to them to actually not just take a pill, so I have a lot of patients looking for a natural remedy, an intervention, something that they can do to sleep better or feel less tension or things like that. So that's in a nutshell, my niche. Mm -hmm. You just overwhelmed me with keywords <laughs> that, <laughs> that are important in my work as well. Women, uh, anxiety or somatization, presentation of heart disease as other diseases or presentation of anxiety or depression as heart disease and link between mind and body minorities and and in general uh, you know utilizing lifestyle medicine pillars and other techniques to curb anxiety, to curb mental issues, to help other, other issues with health, you know, to thrive, you know, mm -hmm. to uh, other body systems to thrive. Tell me more, tell me more <laughs> well, about, I mean, about you're, you're... Two, two things. I want to know about two things. Sure. Number one, symptoms that your patients come to you with they're saying we are under stress we have anxiety and we have xyz symptoms that may be suggestive of heart disease uh, blood pressure problems etc etc uh, do you think those are somatization or those are real um you know expressions of disease of cardiovascular disease because mm -hmm. to me as a cardiologist i am very interested in stress as being a major risk factors for cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. per se 
not just asomatization, but a major underlying cardiovascular risk factor of, for disease, disease, you know, um, milieu, creating the milieu for disease. So uh, are, are they complaining of cardiovascular symptoms for real or somatization of both? Number two, techniques that you're using, what are they? And this is very important. And that will lead me to the next question about science and about randomized control trials that are being a, as a ground or background for you using certain techniques. Is there a literature, literature to base the use of your techniques to uh, heal? Okay, great. <laughs> well, first, I want to appreciate what you just said, is that, you know, we both know that the, the continuation of certain symptoms can result in cardiovascular disease. So if you don't get a handle on the somatization, um, or you don't get a handle on the underlying root causes or stresses, as they say in functional medicine, then you, you know, you do kind of go down that path. And as a yogi, I tend to look at all sort of conditions as dis-ease, like not disease, but dis-ease, right? And I believe that based on our environment and our genetics is how we manifest the condition. So I prefer to approach my patients with what are your concerns, you know, not necessarily what are your diagnoses uh, and what are your, you know, your problems, but what is your background? What is your genetic risk? What, what are you feeling? Like, what are your symptoms? And I gather that data and sometimes patients, you know, say, you know, like they've never heard so many questions <laughs> from a practitioner, but I feel like, especially the first visit, if you can gather all this information that's already like some of it has already been filled out in surveys. Mm -hmm. And if you can gather and put the, start to put the pieces of the puzzle together, then you could provide the most care and support. And that's where you know, even though I'm in a sort of medical setting and I still hold the philosophy of nursing care, support, environment, nutrition, very much as a part of the way that I operate. So for me, it's really making the patient comfortable in a conversation so that I can get the best data from that patient in order to provide them the most support and to also empower them to, you know, make whatever changes they need to make given, you know, societal constraints or neighborhood issues or environmental toxins or burdens that they, that they, um, that they undergo. Secondly, um, I, you know, I take that information and I, you know, tr attempt to couch it in such a way that like down regulates their anxiety about coming into a clinic in the first place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and so some of the techniques, you know, that I use say they come, they're coming with, um, they're manifesting with high blood pressure and they say, oh, my blood pressure is normal at home. I just have high blood pressure in the office. Then, you know, a couple of techniques that I use is, you know, wait, uh, don't take, you know, what the um, medical assistant has written down as the blood pressure but wait um, after we go through some of the visit and towards the end, right before I'm getting to do my physical exam, I have them take a few deep breaths and then I recheck their blood pressure. And amazingly, many times the blood pressure goes down. So breathing techniques, lowering you know, the, the respiration and that's the, one of the only things that really we can control in our body. Everything else is sort of automated processes. So really focusing on the breath work to me is like so critical. And then I also have a handy little trick where I, you know, about lavender, I'll have to send you the research on this, but 
um, there has been a, a meta-analysis of all the studies done on lavender and carrying a little vial of lavender in your lab jacket. Well, first of all, don't wear a lab jacket, right? Because that creates anxiety, but um, having a little- Yeah, vial it's, not, it's not in vogue anymore. <laughs> Doctors, doctors, doctors don't wear them anymore. Right, right. <laughs> for it's that very, involved, for that very anymore. reason, no. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So that little vial, just you know, like you know, putting a few drops on a on a gauze and like having them smell that three times within three seconds, that goes to the brain, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, and yes. actually has a calming effect, and the research, you know, backs it up. So I have, you know, requested various different things of the pharmacy, <laughs> and this is my latest uh, request is to have uh, bottles of lavender oil, essential lavender oil, prefer preferably organic, in the office um, and utilize that for patients with high blood pressure and our medical director is actually considering and I sent her the research, which I'll also send you the link. I sent her the research. Um, she has actually, um, you know, told me that I could present at the next practitioner meeting on this and that I could also uh, ask my managers to order these bottles and start utilizing them. And we will put them into our protocol. So the diastolic number doesn't get affected as much. It does go down, but the systolic number goes down considerably. And this starts to make sense with the story, right? Mm -hmm. So the patient's story or what we call the HPI really gives us insight into what's going on with them, right? And so when they say, my blood pressure is always normal at home, I say to them, well, you know, this is a, you know, this is a scenario in which you're becoming, you know, maybe nervous or anxious, but if you have multiple scenarios over the course of the day and over time that are shooting your blood pressure up like that, that's really, you know, this is a cardiologist, that's not good, <laughs> you know, and the cumulative effect of this stress and the pressure. And I, I often give like the example of the garden hose you know, and turning on the water and like the pressure being so high or like lifting a heavy weight, you know, and like, are you going to, you know, create a crack or a fissure or, you know, a weakness, an aneurysm. So I use those as like, you know, examples, just like I do in my book, you know, sort of everyday examples, simple examples so that they can understand what the what the consequences are on their body mm -hmm. um wow <laughs> i'm a little bit overwhelmed by um <laughs> by the I hope in a good way <laughs> the, the coherence of your information with what i've been practicing i've been practicing and i'm conveying to my patients and i'm conveying to my patients who are physicians and who have been healthcare professionals all their lives and i'm conveying the message that high stress environments uh fast-paced lives and high stress jobs are a milieu the settings for um the creation of chronic disease essentially mm -hmm. for healthcare professionals who may become patients themselves if Absolutely. they do not We're pay attention <laughs> and if we all can become patients if we don't pay attention if we don't use certain techniques to slow down to guard our minds our bodies and hearts to unwind to practice mindfulness meditation to create um, uh, favorable work environments and home environments for thriving right mini blue zones at work and at home and if we don't become wellness champions at work and recreate the camaraderie the the most favorable work environment at, at work and create a chain effect at our workplaces that will conduce thriving so 
that's thriving, my message as, as well. Thriving, not just surviving, right? <laughs> thriving, not just surviving. But but also I recommend, you know, those breathing techniques throughout the day and mini mm -hmm. meditation session throughout the day to my to my patient, to my physician patients, you know, even between the patients, between patient rooms, I recommend doing four, seven, eight breathing techniques, or even going to the bathroom and quickly refocusing, you know, doing mm -hmm. um you know, mini meditation, mini mindfulness sessions between the patients or closing the door to their office and just mm -hmm. kind of, you know, doing the grounding, the quick re refocusing with right. breathing, et cetera, et cetera, among others. Um, you mentioned, before we go to science, you mentioned the book, I Need an Hour, our listeners have to hear about this wonderful book of yours. Go for it. Tell us more about it. <laughs> okay, sure. Well, uh, there is a short video on YouTube, about seven minutes, and there's also um, 10 pages that you can read for free on Amazon to see if you would be interested in getting it. And it is really targeted towards the general population. So the language is very accessible, very simple. And basically what it does is it uses um, car analogies to go through chapter by chapter, what are the most important sort of screening tools and measures that we look at as practitioners, but patients aren't really aware of. <laughs> so you know, they come in and we're like looking for all their care gaps and their quality measures and trying to tick them off. But patients don't have a clue what we're doing, at least most of them, especially if they don't carry like a my chart or something like that, that helps them track, you know, what is good for them to do at what age. So the younger the person, you know, gets my book, the better. It's kind of like a mini car manual, but it's also good for practitioners who want to practice more integratively or more with lifestyle medicine. I actually finished the book before I finished my board certification for lifestyle medicine. So I couldn't put that on the book, mm -hmm. but it's so much aligned. Just like I said, it's so much aligned with yoga. And what I did was I split up the seven chapters into the seven and principal energy centers of yoga, also known as the chakras. And every chapter has a either car or road analogy and starts with chapter one grounding um, energy center one. And so what is, you know, grounding look like, you know, for your health and wellness and what are the things that you need to do in order to do that? So I start with the annual exam and, you know, move forward. So right, chapter right. car state inspection, <laughs> exactly the, the, the baseline inspection, you know, yeah. uh, before you get the car and, you know, and so forth. So the fun little car analogies help, you know, clients or patients to remember, you know, what are the things that are critical. And at the same time, you know, there's this, um, there's this lifestyle medicine and yoga infusion throughout, you know, the, the chapters. And so it goes from grounding all the way to the end of life discussions. Mm. And, Mm -hmm. um so it's you know wow that sounds amazing so again yeah. what is the title it's called car talk body talk car Inter talk body talk Inter everybody Inter get the book <laughs> <laughs> well the subtitle is integrative primary care for adults only so you know i'm an adult nurse practitioner so of i don't course. you know uh, go into pediatrics i try to stay in my lane but if this, you know, I've had uh, late teenagers reading the book mm -hmm. and really feeling like, oh, I need to keep this for the rest of my life and make so sure that I'm on track. And I know, you know, and I think, you know, when we're forced to have like these shorter visits, which we often are, it's really important to have a more educated consumer who knows like what's due when, and they actually come in for their preventatives instead of just coming in when they don't feel well. And we would have such a healthier population, you know, if we just caught things on time or before time, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting because I'm catching you on that word adults only because <laughs> I want to, I want to just know something. 
I am doing something for the youngest of the young. So I am creating a product now for, literally speaking, preschool children to teach them lifestyle medicine in the situation of playing. So in a play. Um, it's in the process of being created. I am I am going to, you know, trade market, et cetera, et cetera. But I also found that the studies show us and the the Surgeon General also pushes the notion that the earlier we start this education, the more the merrier, you know. The same thing with lifestyle medicine, with wellness, with burnout prevention. We need to start it like in training for medical professionals, for instance. They say the earlier the better, they, they, they are more receptive, they are, you know, they will be thriving more and more, they will learn. So I was wondering if we could do something together for <laughs> for the kids that would and, be fun. <laughs> and create something similar to the car book or car talk or any talk you know for the kids um from let's say age four i found my my grand granddaughter is five now but when she was three and a half i found that i could talk to her explaining simple concepts yeah. and my grandson is three now so i think it's a little bit early you know but yeah. start an age like four and a half five through nine i think this is a crucial time when they get every information all the information out there and they start processing it processing it through their brain creating oh, really? concepts creating live long concepts so i invite you there <laughs> to co-creation co-creating a book a product or something that will teach our younger generation kids literally speaking uh, the same thing, the same concept that you just mentioned through play, through interactive environment um, to learn, you know, about their bodies, about their, you know, <laughs> the disease, the health disease, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Ex no, challenge, are, challenge accepted. <laughs> a challenge accepted. I, you're actually read my mind because I actually talked to a, a integrative pediatric friend of mine. It, would she be interested in the next version, like doing it for kids? Much so, needed, much needed. And she said uh, yes, but I haven't heard back from her. So if she right. <laughs> well, <laughs> he doesn't bite on it, Lana. Hey, got <laughs> me <you>. now. <laughs> well, Adele, listen, uh, let's move on to that science question because oh, we're sure. still on question number two now. <laughs> what? you mentioned um aromatherapy you mentioned mm -hmm. mindfulness uh, meditation um, breathing techniques breathing that you said that if you had to use something or base your approach on something that is well grounded in literature would be breathing right what randomized studies will you use to validate those you know lifestyle medicine interventions in your patients to improve their quality of life improve their endpoints improve maybe their survivorship will not probably go that far but their quality of life and endpoints um and what research is still needed there you know honestly there have been so many studies on the benefits of yoga um for um, back pain, cardiovascular issues, um, mood, um, hypothyroidism, major depressive disorder. Uh, there's been, there's been so many studies. It's kind of hard to just, you know, pick one or two. I'll definitely send you, uh, are some... they, are they well designed? Are they randomized? Are they, Yes. Yeah. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, some of the RCTs come back from like a while ago, but there's still, there's still some, you know, going on. There was, um, there was an RCT in, in actually cardiac rehab on blood pressure variability mm -hmm. that, um, post MI that I can send you. And I also, think I have that one. Yes, but send you, because okay. we will post the links under the description of the podcast so everybody can go and use those links, okay. you know, in their practice or for their 
own hues. And then more recently, as you, I mean, as you know, as time goes on and studies accumulate, there are s systematic reviews and meta-analyses mm -hmm. um, that are done. And there was one done um, in frontier psychiatry on the effectiveness of yoga for major depressive disorder, um, which was a systematic review and meta-analysis of many different um, RCTs. So 34 RCT studies uh, were done. And really the conclusion was that yoga can improve depressive symptoms and anxiety in patients with MDD and um, in a safe and wide patient acceptance. So I feel like, you know, the studies have been done in multiple scenarios in multiple populations all over the world. And you know, the research is there, the evidence is there, we just have to implement it, you know, and the, you know, my pie in the sky dream is to have a, a, a clinic type setting that has every color of the, the primary chakras, and that you're actually, you know, helping patients to balance based on the imbalances that are presenting mm -hmm. um, and having, you know, a full integration of, you know, these are the particular exercises or activities, or this is the food that correlates with your, you know, imbalance, and then taking into account their epigenetics, their, you know, their environment and their genes and how all that interacts and how deeply stacked their deck of cards is, you know, against them or not, because that's another analogy I use with my patients is that, you know, my you know, a deck of cards is stacked pretty high because I have heart disease in my family. I have stroke in my family. I have diabetes in my family. I have high blood pressure in my family. And knowing all this, as you said, from a young age, I think just intuitively, no one told me, but from the age of 11, I was getting up at 530 in the morning to practice. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, neither of my parents actually did exercise that early in the morning, but they both did walk. I always saw them walking and taking care of themselves. And I was very much into dancing and aerobics from a young age and always, you know, very active um, in, in various different activities, mostly arts and science. So uh, I tended to, and theater and singing, things like that when I was young. So I wasn't really that much into sports. So intuitively I knew that I had to get up and exercise, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and lucky for me, you know, I was raised in a Indian household with a mom who chose to only work part-time so that she could provide nutritious um, Indian meals for us. Talk about work-life balance because with three kids, you know, and Indian food is, you know, a little more on the complex side. So a little, you know, more labor intensive, she made it a point, you know, to make us nutritious meals. And that was, you know, always amazing and really, you know, set forth, you know, a path for me in terms of health and wellness. It was funny because I was at the Peapod conference to rack up some CEUs in New Jersey uh, last fall. And somebody asked me, you know, um, because a lot of people, you know, kind of get on the bandwagon a little bit later in life. And asked me, like, how long you've been plant based? I was like, how long have I been plant based? How long have I lived? <laughs> <laughs> I've been plant based my entire life. Right. <laughs> right. You know, so I guess it's like the the question of the year, you know, how long have yeah. you been plant based? <laughs> but um, I'm like, I am a plant. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I've always been plant based. So, so yeah, I think, uh, I think it's, um, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right. Um, I just, I want to reflect to what you just said. Um, our genes is not our destiny, you know, many cardiologists and Dr. Bennett said that, Dr. Dr. Ornish says that, Dr. Campbell says that, um, everyone says that, and I can say that, and this is on your face. It's on your face. You have no wrinkles. You're glowing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> whatever you have done for yourself it's working and you are you look wonderful so Thank you. whatever you've been doing all your life uh, how many years it is so it's it's been working so your epigenetics you mentioned 52. those I'm 52. genetic oh thank you those genes that you have in your family whatever you worked around them you you constructed <laughs> I'm doing, this, I'm trying. this deck Let me of tell card you. you deconstructed this deck of cards stuck up and you <laughs> you made this whatever whatever cards you you put in it it looks good now That's funny. it looks a different deck of cards from what used to be before so 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 keep doing what you're doing and um and teach Well, you're right your about that. We can change our expression. You absolutely know, one of the things, you know, we learn in functional medicine is sort of, you know, the, the, uh, the three finite processes, the oxidative stress, inflammation, mm-hmm and autoimmune, and like that, you know, trajectory of like how we get sort of inflamed, you know, and right going down hey the we can't 100 percent change our genetic makeup i mean if if we have certain you know um horrible congenital diseases that's that's forgiven but but as far as as far as you know predisposition to disease right Predis a predisposition that can be avoided with proper care yes that we can change with the course of our actions and lifestyle interventions Mm -hmm. so <laughs> lifestyle choices we should say not interventions interventions may be a little bit too late but choices and this this is when you are you know uh, uh to early early choices in your childhood and this is what i'm trying to push to start everything early to teach our children our poor undereducated children around us growing unaware blissful unaware of healthy choices eating whatever sitting for seven hours a day before you know in front of the computer anyway let's move on <laughs> yeah yeah let's no that's move on true you know like uh it was hard pressed to find candy in my house you know my mom yeah <laughs> my mom was pretty strict you know but he you know now when you talk about eating colors you know kids will just look at you and say skittles fruit loops you know <laughs> You, you know, I had so much candy in my house. We had so much. I was the only child. I was the only child. And I was essentially raised by my grandma, who was at home all the time. My parents were working all the time. <laughs> my, my mom was a psychiatrist. She was running the department. She was the head of the department. And my dad, uh, my dad actually went to Gulag. for his political views when I was 11. And um, I was raised by my grandmoms who gave me everything I wanted <laughs> from education and travel to uh, sweets The candies and and, cookies. <laughs> and everything else. So I had to monitor myself and, and um, um, intuitively. intuitively as you said you know i enrolled myself in track and field um, when i was nine and um, and did a lot of things for my for my own you know <laughs> physical um health essentially intuitively but um yeah that's another story uh, let me ask you another question <laughs> another question there are so many missing links in our field unanswered questions yes and in your in your field of lifestyle medicine and wellness what are those unanswered questions what are those critical gaps that include maybe business maybe technology maybe involving patients or research that need to be addressed in the next maybe five to ten years I think for me, in terms of behavioral health um, and uh, mental wellness and really seeing uh, change is a couple of things. Uh, one, I feel like, you know, there's a critical sort of gap in further understanding of the microbiome. and how the host of microbes in our gut interact with serotonin receptors and affect our nervous system. 
And we, we know that prebiotics, you know, which are found in herbs and vegetables are great and they feed the probiotics, um, which we can also get from kefir and yogurt and supplements, but we haven't, you know, gotten to a place where we can really recommend um, exactly what those are. And so from a standpoint of mental health and behavioral health, there is some understanding and there's, you know, there's a lot of information coming out these days in a general sense about it. But I think, you know, I think research could go a little bit deeper and really publicize in the mental health, you know, arena, how much this really does happen and how, you know, it's not from the neck up, you know, all roads lead to the gut. <laughs> and, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh, wait, that's car talk. <laughs> I don't know if I wrote that in there. I should have. Um, second edition. Um, or maybe the child's version. <laughs> nice. um, so I think that is really a critical gap. Um, the other is, you know, one of my deeper passions around, and you had mentioned it briefly about the blue zones, is, you know, really from a health equity um, vantage point and being a health equity advocate is, you know, how do we in terms of business, technology, the way our environment is set up, really promote more blue zones everywhere. And, mm -hmm. and how can we sort of undo, you know, some of the, the, the historical redlining that just persists and, and, you know, these uh, neighborhoods, which have no grocery stores, and they just have become food deserts. And mm -hmm. how do we, how do we figure out a way to sort of level the playing field? I know this country has lots of resources and it's just, it's just unfortunate the way that, you know, the way that places are designed and we really have to move that, move that forward. Otherwise, you know, the, um, some of us being sick makes us all sick. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I really believe that, unless we're, you know, reaching for the underdog and really lifting everybody up, we're never going to get to that place. And I think the blue zones teach us that, you know, that sense yeah. of community, the sense of, you know, eating ancestral foods, you know, how, how they found all these sort of commonalities in all these places. And how do we spread that? You know, how do we, how do we, utilize sort of like the technology and the business we have. And you see it in small businesses. There's a lot of sort of green businesses popping up or more organics. You know, I was, I was doing, giving a talk the other day, actually. Um, and, you know, I told them you vote with your dollar. So when you purchase these things, that's what companies start creating and making, you know, and if you, yeah. We do that. Supply more. follows demand for sure. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> if you do that more and more, then that's the way the world will turn, you know? So, <laughs> you know, we have to move from like fast food nation to these, you know, Bernie Sanders four day work weeks and, <laughs> and, you know, this <laughs> work life balance. Oh, you should see my most recent talk on slow living. You just, I, you are on the topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're fast really food, slow there. food, sharing, slow entertainment. Yes. Yeah. I mean, slow so many exercise. Yes, plenty of opportunities. Oh my goodness. Now, how can our professional society, America, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, ACLM, help to implement those visions? Well, how can they help? I think um, ACLM has a lot of leverage and power. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I personally would like to see them move from six pillars to seven. So I have a perfect overlap <laughs> with my framework of care. Um, but, you know, seeing the person as uh, a whole bundle of energy where there may be imbalances um, 
you know, kind of helps to bridge the gap between sort of Eastern and Western approaches to care. And we have this never ending growing diversity of the US in particular and providing care that like really speaks to our population is critical, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we have more and more immigrants, we have more and more, you know, different disparities showing up. And I think lifestyle medicine has the opportunity to, you know, get into these communities and not just have a committee, you know, on on it, but actual sort of action plans moving forward in communities like what they've done with New York and how they've, you know, plant based is like the default option in the hospital. Like, that's amazing, you know, so things like that, that, um, you know, not necessarily having to know the details in which, you know, we're viewing their case, but we can move the needle on wellness if we identify where the blockages might be and like how mm -hmm. we can help them sort of get into the flow of life better, whether that's one patient at a time or communities at a time. And to me, like if we focus on the communities, we can have a greater impact, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I hope a good salad bar reaches our hospital cafeteria <laughs> because our salad bar in the hospital is all from cans. Can you oh, believe wow. it? That's wow. Bad. And we are in a very rich and affluent community here. <laughs> so there are billions of dollars sitting around and the salad bar in a major hospital is all from cans. That's People, it. give That's me a it. break. That's that's great. You know, the other thing ACLM could have a push on is, is plastics because mm -hmm. oh. this is plastic. Oh. you just reminded me with You're the salad. You're so good. You're so good. It comes yes. in plastic containers. And, you know, my husband and I always joke about this, that like the triangle on the bottom, you can't even read it, you know, like this one, two, three, four, five. And so you don't know if it's getting recycled or not. You don't know also which of those microplastics, that's another area of research mm -hmm. that's really, you know. Yes, it, yes. It, that we digest there. it. We've yes. We've already seen it. And we know that it's an obesogen. So this is huge. So if ACLM, you know, tackled that, made like pushed industry to make those triangles bigger Number one, or just remove plastic. And number two, substitute remove those... plastics. Yes, yeah, like grocery stores. Like there's some kind of policies. You know, right now it's up to the particular. You make paper straws, make paper containers, make paper cups, paper bags, everything instead of fully recyclable. You should see. I just came yeah. from Korea several weeks ago. I mm -hmm. spent several weeks in Korea just learning their culture. My my um, um, grandchildren are half Korean. My son-in-law is Korean. So, oh, okay. yeah, so uh, they are amazing on recycling, on, uh, um, you know, sustainability and all that stuff. And he is actually an engineer on sustainability. So it was oh. my interest how they maintain the green zones and sustainability and all that. They are obsessed with recycling they do not have this plastic and anything is you know sitting around everything is tiny little small utensils everything and it took me in my hotel to to do recycling three days i was doing that recycling <laughs> separating scraps of food in a separate container those tiny little things in separate paper <laughs> it, it painstakingly just to recycle it takes yeah. so many different containers to recycle different parts of recycling materials they're good those people will go far you follow yeah. me to save yeah. their own country and we, we should and do there's other country examples too you know and i was of traveling course. with southeast asia i was just amazed yeah. yes you know and yeah. you know there is uh this is kind of funny but there's in you know built-in bidets and hoses everywhere yeah. from japan to singapore it's like they're not wasting paper they're no. not flushing it down the toilet uh -huh. They're like minimally using, you know, to dry or something. But I, I mean, we have built-in bidets at home too. I love it. We save yeah. so much, you know? I mean, these are little ways I actually mentioned in the book too. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned the bidet. There. The, the Hello, Gwyneth like Paltrow. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> you know, and they're not, they're not expensive. So, I mean, there are ways to, you know, really reduce um, and reuse and recycle and just avoid that I think ACLM could have, 
you know, as powerful group as they are, could have a serious impact, you know, yeah. on communities and policy um, when it comes to plastics and how we can get away from plastics because they're killing us, they're killing our oceans, they're changing, they're just eliminating certain species of fish and killing yes. off birds. Yes, yes, yes. such no a great to... point, such a great point. I also, you mentioned the seventh pillar and I also want the eighth pillar, provider wellness. It's, mm -hmm. it's a very important pillar and we cannot go to those six or seven pillars without this one important pillar because our wellness is a foundation for every other pillar we mm -hmm. preach. You follow me? Yeah. So, oh, that's another article I have to send you. Actually, I wrote an article oh. about the uh, quadruple aim mm -hmm. as a framework for integrative uh, group medical visits with two other colleagues of mine and the quadruple is for the practitioner. Of course, of course. And the group visits is sort of, you know, in the center of the whole, you know, the rest of the triple aim. Right. So if you're interested, I'll send you the link on that. Yes, of course you do that. So to wrap up our conversation, which we spilled it over an hour, that's great. I love it. I could talk to you for like hours. We're like sister souls. It's so funny, yeah. so <laughs> much fun. Um, Adea. To wrap it up, um, what are um, the next five to 10 years uh, looking like for you? What's the future for you? What are those unanswered questions that you're going to answer for yourself and for your medical profession in the nearest future? Well, I would really like to get my framework out there so that more practitioners are kind of thinking in this way. And I've outlined how, um, uh, my pyramid framework overlaps with the different systems um, of conventional medicine, lifestyle medicine, and even the functional uh, seven biological systems um, and learn from the very beginning, like various different modalities that can help, you know, people to balance um, and they can become better guides and patients um, will feel like more supported with a guide by their side versus like watching or listening like to a sage on the stage, you know, and in the age of AI and social media, the general public can learn a lot on their own unless we're, unless we're dialed in to what's out there, we can't provide the holistic guidance they need, you know, to reach their optimal health. So um, yeah, maybe another book co-authoring with you and just really like getting at that sort of pre-service level, um, and realizing that conventional, you know, medicine is not the only thing that should be from the gate, you know, it should be lifestyle medicine. It should be infusing these, you know, principles of really what's happening at the cellular level, what's happening at the community level and how can we create bluer and greener spaces? Mm, mm, so well said. Dr. Anama Odea Thomas, thank you so very much for your time, your expertise, and you being with us today and sharing all this information. We have learned so much from you today, and it was so much fun to talk to you there. And thank you so much for your contribution to the field of lifestyle medicine and wellness. I wish you a happy and healthy year and your business a prosperous and happy future thank you so much i really had a great time as well and you can find me on social media at you solely care u-s-o-l-i-c-a-r-e and my website is www.usolicare.org and um, i look forward to collaborating with you and other lifestyle medicine practitioners too Thank you. Thank you. And with that, thank you so much for listening and uh, looking at our Cardio Seeds podcast today. Don't forget to subscribe, including our YouTube Cardio Seeds channel and give your likes on social media. Please check out my book, Resilience with Scrubs, Thriving as a Woman Resident Physician on Amazon. It's available in paperback format and on Kindle. So give it as a gift to your doctor, to your friend, to your colleague. It was your host, Dr. Svetlana Shimon, CEO of Cardio Seeds. We'll see you in the next time. Goodbye.